Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Everbloom devlog series. Now that we've finally got introductions out of the way, we can really start to show off more of what our plans are. If you're new to the series, Everbloom is a farming roguelite with dating sim aspects, where your main goal is to dive into a dangerous infested cave called the Maw, collect a bunch of different types of seeds to bring back to your base, grow them, and use them to handle more and more challenging enemies. The villagers will then help you by giving you a way of getting items that are otherwise unobtainable, as well as having the fun side objective of building relationships, which also help you as you explore the mall. Alright, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about what's happened since the last devlog. The plan for this month is to overhaul the art and systems we have in place. We really need to nail down and fix some of the foundational visual issues the game has. Basically, we need to make an actual functioning playable area, not just a pretty presentation you can sort of walk around in. The first problem we had to tackle was aligning the assets properly. Our assets are drawn with a resolution of 32 by 32 pixels, so we'll be using a grid comprised of 32 pixels per unit by utilizing Unity's built-in Snap to Grid feature. Except, this doesn't work. In Unity, the center of a sprite is the pivot point. This pivot point can exist anywhere on the sprite. If, for example, it exists in the middle of a pixel, we would be snapping to that rather than the edge like we expected. There are a number of different ways to fix this issue, such as updating every texture in the game to have a proper pivot point, but we believe the best solution is to just write a script that would handle this pivot error instead. Once we could get the actual assets to align properly with each other, it was time to get to work on making tile sets. Tile sets are nice because they make prototyping levels really easy, as well as giving the ability to apply specific attributes to a particular tile. Painting out an entire scene definitely looks really nice, as you're not limited by the grid of the tiles, but it doesn't exactly work so well once you try to add functionality. Making the tile sets was a relatively straightforward process. Each tile has a specific width and height that determines the amount of detail it has, so all that needed to be done was to start drawing assets that look nice together. Where things start to get tricky is when you start making specific shapes that need to repeat infinitely. Making infinitely tileable grass is pretty simple since the jaggedness that might come with the tile transitions can be waved away as grass blades sticking out. But once you start trying to tile things such as pavements with a border, things become slightly confusing. Ultimately, it's not that much more difficult than grass, but the process is a little different. The method we used was standardizing where pixels would also meet at the edges. As long as the edges always stay the same, anything placed in the middle doesn't matter. This seems like it'd be obvious from the get-go, but our artist is very, very stupid. Since the tile sets are now done, levels like the one you're looking at now take less than 20 minutes to create. But that's not where this ends. We also need to make rules for how certain tiles interact with each other. Things like multi-tile high mounds need to be set up in a way where, when applying a rule, it's able to detect the top of a mound tile and place whatever specified amount of tiles underneath it. Now that the testing is made, let's import that into Unity. We now need to face another issue that has plagued the project since its inception, layer sorting. The problem right now is that we don't have any way of accurately placing the player in front of or behind any given object. Usually this is solved with Unity's pivot points, tracking the player's Y position, and swapping what sprite is in front based on the Y coordinate relative to the pivot point. The reason why this didn't work for us at first was because the method in which tiled handle sprites didn't allow us to change the pivot point without a lot of additional programming. The solution was to edit the base layers of the level, such as grass, mounds, and roads, and tiled, and then handle the objects that require collision or proper layering using Unity prefabs. This allows us the benefits of tiled for quick and simple tiling, as well as using prefabs for objects that will have complex scripts and logic later. There's probably a better way of doing this, but this sort of workflow is convenient because of how nicely tiled integrates with Unity and how quickly large sweeping map changes can be made. So, now that all the visual bugs are fixed, we can finally start working towards redoing some of the art assets. You may be asking, what was wrong with the art style before? To put it extremely simply, there was little structure to the level's design. In art, there's something called a visual hierarchy. Basically, what is the most to least important thing on the image. This rule guides the eye and helps the viewer enjoy a more cohesive drawing. That's fine and all for painting, but on the surface, this doesn't seem super related to video games. However, what this rule helps us with is clarity. At no point should the player wander around and be unable to figure out where their next destination is, or even worse, the player can't even see their own avatar amongst the flurry of colors. The biggest issue is that due to the oversaturation of almost every asset, 
Nothing looks important. Every single pixel is clawing at your attention, which is bad because there's not really an easy way to subtly guide the player through the level. For instance, in this scene, the ramen stall and the rocky beach are both grabbing at your attention. Now, you could say that the ramen stall is a clear winner here, as it is the main focal point of the whole image, but the rocky beach takes out a lot of the main punch. It's not the only culprit either. The saturation of the grass and the over-detail of the trees make for a very bright and noisy image. So, with that being said, there's a lot of work to do. The first thing was to desaturate the grass by quite a bit. While it looked very pretty, it simply did not give any breathing room for other more important props. After fixing that, the trees and shrubs also need a complete redo. While they look nice on their own, as I said earlier, they are very noisy and look quite bad when combined together. So now we'll instead opt for a more shape-oriented design. There's less detail, but overall, it's more pleasant to look at. Since Everbloom is a plant-focused game, having beautiful foliage was a given. Things like mushrooms, flowers, and different types of shrubs were all created for set dressing. Small details like these really give a lot of opportunity for world building and storytelling. With the sheer amount of foliage planted around the scene, you could quite reasonably make the assumption that this location is safe and brimming with life. Aside from that, the monster concept art we showed off in the last devlog has now been made into game accurate sprites, which is pretty exciting because it brings us closer to the combat update. A huge part of making satisfying combat is good sound design and animation work, so wait for us until then. Everloom's core structure is really starting to take shape. Now that we have a solid base to build features off of, we can really start working towards making Everbloom feel more like a game, rather than a walkable art gallery. Tune in next month to see what we make next. We'd love to have you around, and if you like how the project is progressing so far, then please leave a like and subscribe. Otherwise, see you in 30 days.